What would you do if you had three wishes? I remember pondering that question a lot after the first time I saw Aladdin. This story of a genie who grants three wishes to whoever rubs the magic lantern. And, and I know that someone is going to say, wish for more wishes, but that's against the rules. Money, fame, the love of another, world peace, power. Those are some common answers. One time, in a rather public setting, somebody asked me, if you could change one thing about the world, what would it be? I think it was intended as an to get to know someone, a question that gets at what they value and how they see the world. I don't remember exactly what I said. Um, something about everyone being able to give and receive love freely and how that might transform the world. But I thought about it afterwards and I wanted to change my answer. So next time somebody asks me, if you could change one thing about the world, what would it be? I would say, I'm glad I can't. I'm glad I can't change one thing about the world. Because what I really believe as I think about that question is that every I could come up with one thing that I would change about the whole world in the snap of a fingers would have a domino effect of unintended consequences and it's just impossible for my mind to imagine how these things would play out. And I really believe that there's a reason that we humans don't have the power or the responsibility to change things in the world just by wishing. And the more I think about it, the more happy I am to leave that to God. Our story this morning takes us by night into Solomon's bedroom when he's a young man, having just been appointed a king over Israel. And in his dream, he hears God say, ask, what should I give you? Tell me what you want. Ask. Ask. What should I give you? What would you ask for? If God appeared to you by night and said, ask. Some of you might know already. Perhaps there's a need so present or a pain so deep or a struggle so real that it springs to your hearts and your lips at such an invitation, ask. Ask God to awaken you to how God is already present in that moment. Ask God for healing, for hope, for the strength to persevere, for the courage to forgive, ask. And alongside that prayer that first springs into your heart, Solomon's prayer offers us two important lessons about how to pray. The first one is this. Did you notice that God says, ask? And then Solomon launches into a long discourse about his history and who God is. 
Yes, God says ask, but Solomon does not begin with his requests. God says ask, and Solomon says, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you, and you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and given him a son to sit on the throne today. So God says, ask, and Solomon begins his prayer by giving God all the credit that God deserves for the good and glorious things in his life. Solomon thanks God, praises God, marvels in God's power and goodness and love. This is the first lesson. Take it to heart and it will transform your life of prayer. Never pray without thanking God for something. Even if all you can muster in the moment is gratitude for the simple gift of your next breath, never pray without thanking God for something. And then Solomon does move to his request. And this is what he asks. O Lord, my God, you have made me a king, although I am only a little child. And I am in the middle of these people who you have chosen, a great people, so numerous that they cannot be numbered or counted. Give, therefore, your servant an understanding mind to govern your people, to be able to discern between good and evil for who can govern this, your great people. And scripture says, it pleased God that Solomon asked for this. Remember, Solomon was invited to ask for anything. What should I give you, God says. And he asks for this, for an understanding mind. He asks for wisdom. Not for anything immediate. He doesn't ask for victory, although Israel was in battle. He doesn't ask for power, although his status was being questioned. He doesn't ask for riches or fame. He does not ask for woe to befall his enemies. He does not ask for everything in his life to go the way he wants it to. He asks God for wisdom. And it's not just about Solomon being humble or self-effacing. I really think that he asked for the best thing that any one of us could ask for, for wisdom. Because the truth is that life will always throw things at us that are beyond our control and beyond our comprehension. And we would lose our center, chasing after each and every one as if we needed to determine the right path and the correct solution and the best outcome and then bring that to God in prayer. Or we could simply ask God for wisdom for enough wisdom to see God in the midst of whatever's happening, for enough wisdom to know the right word to speak or whether this is the best time for quiet, for enough wisdom to know whether that job that you have always wanted is really where God is calling you to be, for enough wisdom to know if the compromise you are being asked to make is a reasonable accommodation or a betrayal of your deepest commitments for wisdom. It's one of the many, many reasons why prayer is so much better than a genie in a bottle. 
because we don't have to take responsibility for figuring out exactly what should happen or exactly what our request should be. Rather, by the habit of prayer and turning to God time and time again with grateful hearts and witnessing all that God has done with our minds yearning for ever deeper wisdom, by that habit of prayer, we will be slowly transformed and our perspective will widen and our capacity for hope will grow. We will loosen our tight grip on the reins of our lives and let go of a little control and live in the freedom of God's mercy and God's grace. Ask. Ask, of course, for those things that leap to your heart and your lips. Do not exclude them from your prayers. Be honest and open with God about what you want, what you need, what you desire, what you hope for, but just add one more thing. Never leave your prayer without asking God for wisdom. Asking God to grant you not a wish, but a new way of being in the world. Harry Emerson Fosdick was a very prominent pastor in the 1930s. It was during the early rise of fundamentalist Christianity in the United States, which insisted on an especially dogmatic and rigid interpretation of the Christian way. And Fosdick at the time was among the most articulate and ardent defenders of a more liberal Christianity. He was well known for his appeals to a less dogmatic approach to faith. He was well known for writing a method of interpretation of scripture that didn't rely on literalism. And he was very well known for his commitment to a progressive social ethic. He was an outspoken opponent of racism, of segregation, and of war. And his payment for all this was that in 1932, he was formally charged by the Presbyterian Church with heresy and apostasy. I don't really do that to ministers anymore. <laughs> well, I shouldn't speak so soon. <laughs> Just a fun fact, uh, his defense counsel at his church trial was a uh, young man named John Foster Dulles, who would later go on to serve as Eisenhower's Secretary of State. That's just a fun fact. <laughs> so Fosdick, facing this trial, avoided what would have been certain conviction by resigning his post as a pastor. But it wasn't before his preaching and his strong witness had deeply stirred the heart of one of his parishioners a man named John D. Rockefeller, Jr., at that time the richest man in the United States. And Rockefeller was so dismayed that Fosdick was without a church that he said, I'll build you one, a beautiful church on Park Avenue in the heart of the city. After a season of prayer and discernment, Fosdick returned and agreed, but on one condition. Fosdick told Rockefeller that he, were, he was worried that if his church was on Park Avenue, that his congregation would be too wealthy. And, he added, he felt that the city's true heart lie elsewhere. And so he agreed on one condition, that the church be built in Harlem instead of on Park Avenue. And so it came to be that on October 5th, 
1930, the Riverside Church held its first worship service on the west side of Manhattan at 122nd Street and Claremont Avenue. A brand new church, the tallest in the country. I can't even begin to imagine the crushing weight of the expectations. Imagine starting a brand new church and already having it be in the largest building in the country. The summer before that first service, Fosdick was in Maine, and he wrote a hymn, a hymn to be sung at the opening of the very first service of the church, a processional hymn for the opening of the Riverside Church. It's called God of Grace and God of Glory. And we'll sing it at the close of worship today. And it was with that hymn that Fosdick asked God for all of the things that he believed a new church would need. Here's the first verse. God of grace and God of glory, on your people pour your power. Crown your ancient church's story, bring its bud to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. And each refrain begins with those words, grant us wisdom, grant us courage. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage. And with all of the things that a brand new church saddled with those kind of expectations might ask for, maybe grant us members, grant us pledges, Grant us wisdom, grant us courage. And it wasn't a bad thing to ask for because how could he have known and who could have known all that those people and that that church and that that city and that this nation would face together in the years ahead? Who? could have known that another world war was just a decade away? Who would have known that one day Martin Luther King Jr. would stand in the pulpit of that church and proclaim for the first time his opposition to the war in Vietnam? Who could have imagined the ways the world would change? Who could have predicted that human activity would warm the planet itself. Who could have known that one September morning that church would welcome wearied-eyed and dust-covered office workers seeking a sanctuary in a city under attack? They couldn't. They couldn't have known. But Fosdick knew this. He knew that whatever would come, whatever those people would need, what they would need in abundance was wisdom and courage to face what tomorrow would bring. And it's true in our lives too. None of us knows what tomorrow will bring. We can't possibly know how our lives will unfold, what curves and forks lie ahead. We could never pray for everything we might need or cover every situation that might arise, but we can awake each day and turn toward the God who bids us ask and say, grant me wisdom. Grant me courage for the facing of this day.